Muazu Jaji Sambo, commander of the Order of the Niger, was born on the 7th of September 1959 in Jalingo, Taraba State. He hails from Taraba. Young Sambo attended Muhammadu Inya Primary School, Jalingo and Federal Government College, Meduguri, where he obtained a WASC grade one distinction. Sambo studied building at the Amudvelo University Zaria and graduated with a second class upper division. He's a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Building, member of the Council of Registered Builders of Nigeria and the Nigerian Institute of Management. In August 1984, Sambo began his working career with the Nigerian Port Authority, the NPA, and rose to become the senior civil engineer. By June of 1987, he had moved to Savannah Bank of Nigeria PLC as senior manager projects, and later as senior manager banking operations and credit. He made subsequent career moves to Allied Bank of Nigeria PLC as Assistant General Manager Administration, Nikon Insurance Corporation, and finally as General Manager Lagos Zone, National Inland Waterways Authority, NIWA, where he meritoriously retired from the public service in September 2019. His Excellency, former Honorable Minister, of Transport, Al Haji Muazu Jaji Sambo. I want to thank you so much indeed, Your Excellency, for joining us here on Executive Edge on Control TV. Thank you, Gimba. It's my pleasure. You know, when uh, I was tasked with this responsibility of reading your, your profile, your biography, those achievements that you've made, quite intimidating, wouldn't you say? Humbly, no. There are a lot more Nigerians that parade greater credentials. But <clears throat> we thank Almighty God for the gift of knowledge and for all the opportunities that were granted us from childhood to maturity and to adulthood. And so for me, the opportunity to serve the country <clears throat> was like payback time. That's it, Gimba. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's been a couple of months now, ever since... Uh uh, your administration ended. Uh, how has life been for you after the call to public service? I must say very, very, very interesting. Um, for those of us, for those people who belong to my generation and those who have had the privilege of the kind of tutelage that we had, we see public service as public service. And that means denying yourself the opportunity to be with your family whenever you want to be, the opportunity to be where you want to be, when you want to be, because you are there to serve the public. We have been imbued with the tradition of our leaders in the First Republic who served the people in the name of real public service. And anybody who genuinely serves the public, Gimba, will always look forward to a time when he will just sit back and give the opportunity to others to serve. And this is what I'm enjoying tremendously right now. I sleep when I want to sleep. I wake up when I want to wake up. I see who I want to see. I can switch off my phone now for two days on because I know I'm not serving the public anymore. Honorable Minister, I'm, I'm just wondering when you say that you're not serving the public anymore. Yes. But you are retired, but you are not tired. And as such, you could be called back any time. What would you say to that? Well, Gimba, the opportunity to serve the public also has its advantages. I will give you an example. We were able to 
while in my short stay in the Ministry of Works and Housing, I was able to attract three roads and some other developments within Jalingo town. And today, each time I get phone calls or people come to me or I visit Jalingo, I keep hearing people saying, I was on uh, Napeb, Keke Napeb, and I hear people saying, God bless this minister who brought this development. Now, the beauty of this is that God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. You never know which one the Almighty Creator will accept and admit you into paradise. So the opportunity to serve the public also gives you the opportunity to be on the right side of God. And that's, for me, what makes it interesting. If I had my way, I am more comfortable in the private sector. Because I have been trained to build homes. And I build homes passionately. And I sell them happily. I make good returns from them. <laughs> okay? Interesting. So, so... So that's, that's it, bring about Gimba. For me, it's, um, it's, um, it depends, again, on what the calling is. There are some public service jobs now that I cannot do, for obvious reasons. I have risen to the level of a minister of the Federal Republic. There are only a few positions in government that you can offer me and I would accept. Not because I lack humility, but because, for example, it wouldn't make sense as it will create the impression of some kind of desperation. You don't go back and say yes, sir, to somebody who was telling you yes, sir, yesterday. Doesn't make sense. Give opportunity to younger ones to grow. Absolutely. Now, still on that same trajectory that uh, you just highlighted on, I'm just wondering what you recount as some of the highlights during your administration. One of the most interesting things I found about the PMB administration is that President Muhammadu Buhari is one leader who would give you responsibility and give you the freedom to discharge the trust that has been bestowed upon you. For him, is a matter of trust. He swore by the Quran to serve the public. But the Constitution requires him to discharge these responsibilities through ministers. And so he disseminates this trust to various ministers. And so it's left for you as a minister who has also sworn either on the Quran or the Bible to discharge that trust according to your conscience and the fear of God. Did you meet your objectives as Minister of Transport? Substantially, yes. And I'll tell you why. When we moved to the Ministry of Transportation, we knew we had only 10 months to spend there. And for me, I want to leave a landmark wherever I am. That has been my hallmark. So what did I do? We got my team together and told them, look, let's identify, after the briefings by the various agencies, and the ministry, I sat down with my team and said, look, let us identify the low-hanging fruits. And since then, some people have come to nickname me the Mr. Low-Hanging Fruits. <laughs> we identified those low-hanging fruits, and believe me, Gemba, we have been able to harvest all of them. A few of them have not come to fruition during my time, but I think we went far enough for anybody to complete the journey. 
What, if you could possibly recount, maybe yes. one or two of those projects? Yes. One of them that readily comes to my mind was the first baptism of fire that I got in the ministry as a result of the kidnap of passengers on the Kaduna Abuja train. When I, assumed, uh, when I assumed duty at the Ministry of Transportation, there were still some captives, I think about 66 of them or so, that were still in captivity. And um, the day I was to resume work at uh, Deep Charima House, I was, the road was barricaded and I couldn't get entrance into the premises. By who? By relations of the victims. With all the press you can think of in the world, including international media, they've come to ask government to do something about releasing their loved ones. And as Minister of Transportation, I was in charge of the Nigerian Railway Corporation. And so I calmly addressed, addressed them and gave them assurances that government has been doing everything possible. And during my time, I will ensure by the grace of God, I still remember those words, that by the grace of, God's, of God, I'm sorry, every single one of them will be released and reunited with their loved ones. And thank God that happened. We got every single one of them released and reunited with their families. No injury, nothing whatsoever. Beyond that, my team and I sat down and said, look, we need to introduce certain measures to ensure that a repeat of this kind of incident does not happen again. And so we introduced initiatives on how to board the train and equipment that were also installed on the train. Uh, some of them I can talk about publicly, some of them I cannot for security reasons. But one of the things I can tell you, which is public knowledge, is that you cannot buy a ticket today on any of our trains on any of the trains if you don't have a national identification number. Absolutely. I bought one today. Good. And I was shocked that I was being asked of my NIN. I said, Oh, that must be the security measure. Yes. Which is your initiative. Exactly. That is the first step of profiling everybody who bought. You see, because in life, you can only steal successfully in a house or in a location with the aid, with the active support of the occupants of that house. Like they say in common parlance, you commit a successful bank fraud only with insiders in the bank. If there are no suspects, if you, if you make sure that you profile everybody who gets, on, gets onto your train, it will be difficult for kidnappers to operate because they will not operate without accomplices on board the train. So the first step, when you profile those who are buying the tickets and boarding the train, they know that they are already what? Booked. And I'm sure most of these bandits, if not all of them, don't have NIN. So that is the first step. The second step is we introduce some equipment. Also, apart from your NIN, there is an equipment which barricades you from entering the station until you are identified. Your face will show and confirm that you are the one who actually owned that ticket. So already we have your picture. So if we want to check who and who boarded our tra the train any day, we know them. Second feature we introduced was monitoring the train and the track. So the, track, the train driver 
can see up to two kilometers ahead of him. And if that is the case, if there is any danger in front, he has 800 meters within which to stop ahead of that danger. Not to talk of increased patrols of the rail track and other security features that I cannot reveal for security reasons. So, and I am happy, Gemba, to note, to the glory of God, of course, that we did what we could as human beings and left the rest to Almighty God. And since then, till today as we speak, there hasn't been any incident anywhere on Nigeria's railway line. That is one area I can say kudos to my team. One of the low-hanging fruits we identified and harvested. The other one was a follow-up to the um, desire of the PMB administration to secure Nigeria's maritime borders, especially the Gulf of Guinea. You know, the Gulf of Guinea is one of the most dangerous waters in the world in terms of pirates, hijacks, and so on and so forth. Now, in June 2021, Mr. President, as he was then, commissioned the Deep Blue Project, domesticated by NIMASA in conjunction with the Nigerian Navy. That Deep Blue Project remains one of the most outstanding legacies of the PMB administration. Prior to June 2021, we have recorded cases of piracy and kidnap in that part of Nigeria's domain in hundreds of cases every year. From June 2021 to date, Gimba, there hasn't been one single case of piracy. Are you aware of that? I've read about it. Good. You can go and check. I'm also wondering how um, the Director General yes. of NIMASA, as you've just mentioned, uh, in partnership with the Nigerian Navy, mm. working together to establish so, that security mm. uh, space within the Nigerian waters and, of course, the Gulf of Guinea. Yes. Uh, that initiative, to what extent did NIMASA, under Bashir Jamo, who was, uh, who is, or who was, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, he still is. General, he still is under your administration. Hmm. How? how? Sorry, before I answer that question, Gimba, I did not finish uh, on what I was saying earlier on. Okay, please. Uh, subsequent to the commissioning of the Deep Blue Project, there was a need to add value to that in terms of regular patrols and enforcements for revenue generation by NIMASA. Years back, NIMASA used to hire boats at costly sums in order to patrol the waters for revenue generation. And one of the things that I happily, and to the credit of Dr. Bashir Jamo, was opportune to do, was to commission the boats that the Director General procured during my tenure. I am happy that I was part of that activity, part of that event. The patrol boats have added value to the asset base of the agency, as well as the revenue generating capacity of the agency. You cannot generate revenue without patrols. Because like you know, nobody likes to pay tax unless they are forced. Coming back to your question, Dr. Bashir Jamo, as DG of Nimasa, is a very, very focused leader. I found him not only focused, not only dedicated and committed, but I found him a man 
with tremendous passion and in-depth knowledge of the industry. I was happy to have worked with him. He has left his footprints in the sands of the maritime domain. And I was glad when President Muhammadu Buhari bestowed him with the national honor of officer of the Federal Republic. It was an honor well deserved. If I had my way, I will give him a second opportunity to serve this country. Okay, clearly he, he must have some more you know, arsenals in him for you to, uh, to uh, declare such support for him. He's a thoroughbred professional. Great. Now, uh, you also commissioned some communication gadgets yes. uh, with, with Nimasa. Yes. Do you think that those, uh, that effort uh, is yielding the desired result? I told you the result already, Gimba. Piracy, zero. And the communication gadgets are part of the Deep Blue project. Without communication, what can you achieve? No matter the level of patrol, when people are at sea, some people are at, on base, onshore. So there is need for communication between those onshore and those offshore. And like I told you, and I humbly request you to cross-check, there has been zero piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, bordering Nigeria's maritime domain since 2021. And we are in 2023 now. We're talking about two years plus. So ships feel happy coming to Nigeria. Businesses by my, in maritime feel happy coming to Nigeria and ports. Apart from securing the lives of seamen, we have also been able to secure the country itself from external aggression through the maritime domain. And when you encourage shipping, what are you doing? You are encouraging trade. When you encourage trade, you know what happens. It's a spiral economic boom. Exactly. Uh, I'm also thinking about uh, the fiscal projects that uh, were executed under your administration as Minister of Transport. Uh, one that will easily come to mind is uh, that that has to do with uh, uh, the railway, which you've talked extensively about. But some people are still concerned about the extension of the railway system to other parts of the country. What, what can you say about that? First of all, Gimba, I would like to tell you that the Federal Ministry of Transportation has a 25-year master plan to ensure that every state capital in Nigeria is connected by rail. You can reduce that time frame if you have the resources. Now, although I am a maritime person, not only by orientation, but also by passion, but I can tell you that from my experience in traveling around the world, The most preferred mode of movement for me is by train. Yes, water is the cheapest. It is the most environmentally friendly. It takes the largest cargo. Unfortunately, we have not been able to develop our inland waterways in Nigeria to the level that we can say compared to the United States of America. What's holding us back? Resources. The plans are there. Resources. And I can tell you for free that if we can develop the River Niger and River Benue and its tributaries, we will be able to replicate what is happening in the USA. America has 50 states, 
38 of those states depend on inland waterways to move their economies. Over these inland waterways, three, over 360 million tons of cargo are moved every year by water, valued at over $100 billion. 60% of America's agricultural exports are moved by water. And that explains America's competitiveness in the world market because their exports are transported cheaply. Now, coming back to Nigeria, we are blessed by the two rivers of Niger and Benue that empty into the Atlantic Ocean. That was the main reason the river Niger was dredged in the first place so that you can have all year round navigability. Along the river Niger and Benue Gimba, you will be shocked to know that lies billions of dollars worth of wealth. How so? Yes. If you take from Lokoja up to the Rima Valley, underneath that valley, apart from its agricultural potential, has one of the largest deposits of gold in the world. From Lokoja down to Enugu, you have the sixth largest deposit of coal in the world. America uses coal for 25% of its energy generation. We need, we need energy here. We need power. We have the coal. What is stopping us? Investors, we need investors, definitely, because our resources are limited. So you can imagine making those two rivers up to the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean navigable all year round. What are you going to create? A transportation hub, an agri agriculture and in the, in the, uh, agro-industrial hubs all the way from the border with Cameroon on the Benue River and the border with Niger on the River Niger, you will have multiple agro-industrial hubs that will create employment for our teamy youths, generate wealth for those who are involved in it, and reduce rural urban migration to the barest minimum. God did not bless Nigeria with the Niger and Benue emptying into the Atlantic Ocean for nothing. I know that if there is a will, there is a way. Yes. Do you think this is attainable? It is attainable. Nothing is impossible. <laughs> okay. I think uh, that will be an excellent uh, place to let it rest. His Excellency, <laughs> the former Minister of Transportation, Moazu Jaji Sambo, uh, we want to thank you so much indeed for giving us an opportunity to look into your life uh, after service. Hoping that um, there is still more in you to deposit in our younger generation for posterity. And we want to thank you for the services you've rendered to Nigeria and to Nigerians. Thank you for being on Control TV Executive Edge. Thank you, Gimba. Most pleasure to be with you. Thank you. <laughs>